Hello and welcome to OH3 SPN Finland. Now I'm very happy to see I've seen a lot of people online recently talking about moving to Linux. And there's a number of points, possibly for and against moving to Linux, but uh, the comments I've seen recently are My laptop's running slow, can anyone recommend a new laptop to run out much of radio software? And the answer, not from me, but from others, has been before you spend possibly a thousand dollars or euros on a laptop, try installing Linux. Other questions, I'm wanting to use my Raspberry Pi for Linux. What applications are available? Can I run various Windows software on it? And similar questions. So I'll start off by talking very quickly about the Linux distributions. Now, this may be confusing if you come from a Windows or Mac world where you have one option and one option only. In the Linux world, there's multiple distributions of Linux. These are basically customized collections of software, which may affect the look and feel of the desktop environment. Some may be aimed at so-called power users. Some aimed more at those users just migrating from Windows and they want everything to look and feel familiar, which is, is fine. There's two distributions I would recommend for newcomers to Linux. First of all, Ubuntu. And secondly, Fedora. Now, these follow two different ecosystems, if you will, in Linux, but both of them have practically the full set of amateur radio tools available in their default repositories. This means, unlike Windows or OS X, you don't need to go to a website, search for software, download it, run the installer. You can just, in the operating system itself, say, install WSJTX, and it will do it for you. You don't have to worry about where it's getting it from. It's all automated, if you will. And that's another quick thing to mention is repositories. In the Linux world, when you install a Linux distribution, all those packages come from a repository. And typically these repositories include most, if not all, of the tools you're ever likely to need. There are, of course, exceptions to this, but most of the main Linux tools, most of the amateur radio software, it's all contained in the default repositories that you get with these Linux distributions. Now, you may just want to run Linux and run your applications and not worry about the other advantages of doing so, but I feel like I should just cover the advantages of open source, just for those that perhaps don't understand. Now, most of the software covered here on the Linux side is open source. You may not care whether it's open source or not, but there's some very good reasons to care. Now, I'm not going to lecture for half an hour, but I will just say, if it's open source, the source code is available. If you're technically inclined, you can look at that source code. If something's not working like you want it to, you can improve that source code. You can edit the source code. You can create your own variants of the software and you can contribute back to the community. And as part of that, with many, many people doing this, the software tends to get regular updates and it can advance quite quickly. So as the amateur radio community discovers new modes or new features or feature requests, they can get added to the software very, very quickly. Also, as part of this, the software can live on beyond the life of the original author. There's multiple examples where some fantastic software has ceased to evolve once perhaps the author has passed away. Or I think in case of some of the Windows software I will mention here, the last update was 2010, not because the author passed away, but the author just moved on to, to other things or lost interest in radio. The fact the source code is available means that anyone can pick this up and continue evolving it, either along the original path or forking it and taking it a different direction. And this is one of the things we saw with WSJTX evolving into JS8 Call, where the original WSJTX source code was used to create an interactive chat mode with relays and mailbox functionality, I have another video that covers some of this. And finally, open source is typically not limited to one particular architecture. Why should you care about this? Well, perhaps you don't, but perhaps you've just gone out and bought a Raspberry Pi and you want to run the same software on an ARM CPU as you do on your laptop. Well, Linux typically lets you do this very easily. Again, if you install a Linux distribution on the Raspberry Pi, Chances are the software you want is already in the default repository. So let's now move on to the software. Now one package that many people use in the Windows world is Ham Radio Deluxe. Now there's no single replacement for this under Linux, 
but you can combine other packages to create something which gives you very much the functionality of Ham Radio Deluxe. Now, you could look at this as a negative, that there's no, no one package that gives you everything you want, or you could view it as a positive, where it gives you more control over the elements you combine. So in terms of radio control, we have multiple options. We have G-Rig, which is perhaps a little bit basic, and we have a more advanced option, which is actually packaged with FL Digi, which we'll cover later. But FL Rig provides quite reasonable control of most radios, which leads us nicely into FL Digi. Now, if you've used FL Digi on Windows, you may not realize that this started life under Linux anyway. The equivalent of FL Digi under Linux is FL Digi, and this will be repeated several times as I go down this list. I've already mentioned WSJTX, and this is perhaps what most people are more familiar with nowadays. FL Digi was great for many of the, let's call them classic modes, but most people now are interested in FT8 and the more modern variants. Again, WSJTX is developed under Linux, so if you're using it under Windows or Mac OS X, you're using a port. So again, there's really no difference if you run this under Windows or Linux. The same environment, the same application with the same interface exists on both. I've already mentioned JS8 Call. Well, JS8 Call is another example of an application based on WSJTX and developed under Linux. So again, if you use JS8 Call under Windows, you'll feel very at home with JS8 Call under Linux. Now we get into the more interesting ones here. Interesting because the same software is not available on both platforms. Under Windows, I used to use MMSSTV, which is part of a range of applications starting with the MM prefix. I think MMSSTV is also a great example of an application that hasn't received recent updates, so it's stuck sometime around 2010. QSSTV under Linux used to be kind of like a poor copy of the Windows equivalents, but because it's received regular updates, it's, it's far surpassed anything available, as far as I'm aware, on the Windows platform. QSSTV does both analog and digital SSTV. It also has a great editor built in, which is receiving regular updates. The last update, QSSTV, was August 2019. Another piece of software I used to use under Windows many years ago was UIView, which is an APRS client. Under Linux, we have Zastier, which again is receiving constant updates, the most recent being April 2020. Moving on to satellite tracking, automatic Doppler shift and rotator controlling, I'm familiar with SAT PC32 on the PC. There are other options, of course, but I think that's the one I used to use many years ago. But perhaps the standard is gpredict under Linux. This has existed for a very, very long time and still receiving regular updates. I mentioned WSJTX earlier. Now, one tool that people use alongside this in Windows is JT Alert. Under Linux, we have Grid Tracker. Now, in fairness, Grid Tracker will also run on other platforms, and it isn't quite exactly the same as JT Alert. In some cases, people think it's better, in others, perhaps lacking. It's probably one you need to check out yourself. All I can say is I've been using Grid Tracker now alongside WSJTX for the last 12 months, and I think it's awesome. Now, I thought I'd mention Packet Radio. I noticed an increase in activity in the UK a few years ago on UHF and VHF, and now I'm much more aware of an increase in activity on HF, particularly 20 meters. Now, there's a number of sound modem packages under Windows that allow your, your Windows machine to act as a hardware TNC, only with increased sensitivity, which is awesome. Under Linux, we have a couple of options. We have the, the standard Linux kernel sound modem, which has been part of Linux since very, very early on. And we also have more modern alternatives. The one I will mention is Direwolf. Now, Direwolf is also available under other platforms, but again, I believe it's primarily developed under Linux. And again, if you've used it under Windows, then you'll be familiar with the configuration. So it's, it's really no different under Linux, but it's an incredibly powerful packet radio modem, which can decode right down into the noise floor. And finally, logging. There's a, a huge number of logging packages under Windows. 
And likewise, under Linux, there's really a, a quite a few as well. There's two I'll mention. There's Xlog, which is quite primitive, but again, it's been available for a very long time under Linux. And secondly, the more modern CQR log, which is quite flexible. Now, I've not used either of these in anger, and I'm aware that many people are now moving to online logging solutions, which seem more flexible in, in general. But if you want a, a traditional logging package, then I would, I would check out these, specifically CQR log, as it seems to be the best of the bunch I've tried. So I hope this has been useful. I hope it's demonstrated that the Linux ecosystem needn't be weird and difficult to get your head around. In fact, much of the software I've listed is exactly the same as in the Windows world because it originated on Linux in the first place. And some of the packages which are different, in many cases, are as good or better under Linux than their Windows counterparts. And of course, under Linux, all of these are free. Although in some cases, donations may be appreciated. So I hope that's of some use. I do hope to cover some of these in more detail at a later date. Specifically, I'm interested in maybe pitting MMSSTV under Windows directly against QSSTV using the same radio, the same audio, and check the decodability of both. So thank you for listening. I hope it's useful. If you have any questions around operating in Linux or equivalents of Windows software, or you want me to cover anything in more depth, then, then please comment on the video, and I look forward to hearing from you. 73s for now, from OH3SPN. Finland.